Hello everyone, um, welcome to our talk on writing and directing. My name is Ekin, I'm a second year drama school student, really happy and excited to be here. Mm. Hi, I'm Emmy, um, I just graduated with a degree in French and I've been with the Youth Forum since 2014. Um, we're going to ask you to introduce yourselves, mm. say a little bit about what you do and how you got there. So if you'd like to start, Abby. Uh, hi, I'm Abby Zakarian. Uh, I'm a, a playwright. Uh, oh, how long have you got? <laughs> uh, I can stop you. <laughs> so so oh I, to try and keep it really short, I, I worked for many years in, uh, uh, as a journalist, as a picture editor for newspapers and magazines. And then I made the switch to writing about 10 years ago, um, which brings me here. Thank you. Hmm. Hello, I'm Morgan Lloyd Malcolm, and I'm a playwright and screenwriter. Um, I started out, I did drama and theatre arts at Goldsmiths and wanted to be an actor, and I started out in comedy doing uh, double act stuff, basically, <laughs> and then realised I had really bad stage fright, and after five years of yeah. um, punishing myself, <laughs> um, I stopped and just focused on writing, and um, I've been doing that ever since. And hi, I'm Poonambra, I'm a director, um, and I, so I sort of focus on directing new writing by diverse playwrights and female playwrights, mm -hmm. and um, the way that I got into that was through the assisting route, and then as well as that I have a devising company called Three Fates, so that's making work with a community of artists, not necessarily starting with writing, mm -hmm. so, I, so um, yeah, I do both of those things. Thank you. So audience and online audience, now you've heard a bit about our panel, start thinking about questions you might want to ask them later on. We have a Q&A, so start thinking. Cool. Should I start with the first question then? OK, this is a funny question, but when did you first start calling yourself a writer? Because you can write and write and write, but wh what's the point where you feel like, now I'm a writer? Is it the success? Is it the... What is it? You go first. Well, do, you, do you know what? I was once told, when I was trying to be a playwright, I was once told I wasn't allowed to call myself a playwright until I'd had a play put on. Oh. <laughs> Which is wrong. Yeah. Um, you're a writer when you write. You write words. Mm. You're a writer. It doesn't, you, don't, you don't have to be legitimised by somebody paying you money for that. You, you write. Mm. And um, I think it's really... It's really restrictive and elitist, actually, to assume that you, you have to wait until that hallowed time that you've been published or produced to be, call yourself if you feel like you want to be a playwright and that's what you want to do call yourself a playwright and you'll do it that's mm. why I, I think yeah. i think I, I totally agree i mean apart from the fact when i was working when i was still working full time as a picture editor and writing my first play i never called myself a writer mm. and i never called myself a writer until i left that industry and started working full-time as a writer which is slightly weird but I think it, it's just that mindset of you're doing one thing so I was always a picture editor but until I left that world and joined this new one then it was like oh okay no that's my job title now but it was okay to call myself that mm -hmm. yeah and with directing I suppose people kind of assume the same thing like if you're not directing a play at yeah. the moment Mm. then can you call yourself a director? Mm. How do you feel about that kind of transition of also confidence yeah. to say that you're a director? Um, that's really interesting. I think um, I basically decided that I was going to be a director when I was 15 years old at school. Mm. Wow. <laughs> and um, I've been thinking about that a lot lately now, thinking back. And um, that's it. for me, it was more like a feeling like a vocation than it was a job. Mm. It's something that I wanted to do, and, and, I, and the thought in my head was, I want to be a director, and um, it's going to take me a very long time to be any good. Mm. And so I knew that I would have to pick up the skills along the way. Mm. And um, really, that's, um, that's how I've done it, is, is kind of finding your own path. So um, there isn't one way to, you know, there's not one system or one book that um, you need to master in order to be a director. Mm. For me, it was about putting together a director's toolbox of lots of different techniques that spoke to me um, and like, you know, assisting different directors and things and sort of finding my own way. Mm. And what was sense. that toolbox? Like, what are, would you say for people who are aspiring directors, mm. what are the main skills that they should be honing? 
Wow. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe book recommendations to become be begin with, maybe. Hmm. Book recommendations? Yeah. Sure. Or, yeah. Um, well, the Katie Mitchell is good. Mm. Everyone knows the Katie Mitchell. I think maybe it's taught in school now. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, um, <clears throat> again, that's one system, and you don't want to ascribe yourself to one system because it can feel really, really overwhelming. Mm. But the basic tools in there are fantastic because she's talking about <clears throat> psychology, the psychology mm. um, of working with the actors. And that's, so that's super helpful. And there's great lists in there, checklists of things when you're directing. So I use those all of the time, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I read Peter Brook, it's amazing, The Empty Space, and I love Anne Bogart. So Anne yeah. Bogart's got two directing books, which anytime, you know, just their li for life as well as for directing and for art, anytime you open one of those, you will feel inspired and you'll look at the world and observe the world as an artist. Do you find and that's really well. what you want to switch on in your mm. brain, so I really recommend Anne Bogart. Um, and also Judith Weston. So Judith Weston is an American acting coach who um, works with actors in Hollywood, but it's a, it's a kind of, um, it's, it's just, it's a more practical version, I would say, of the kind of things that Katie Mitchell is talking about. So that's a, another really great book that I'm enjoying now. Mm. But always, even, even now, that's what I love about my art, is that you're always evolving your process and you can mm. always learn new skills. Mm. And also it's asking, you know, what kind of director do you want to be? Because you might have a passion for musical theater, or you might love mm. dance, or you might love, um, text-based stuff and so I've done lots of different things throughout my career and some of it is like is mashing together different genres and styles mm -hmm. so then I have to go and get the skills to do that mm -hmm. so um nice. so I think that's that was what was great about Katie Mitchell's approach was saying that you can get the skills it's not something that you will innately know mm -hmm. and so that's really about for me um sort of um cultivating your taste as as an artist and looking at what your passions are so, and that's what I did when I was 15, or you know, all teenagers do it. We, we surround ourselves with um, the people that we love musically, poetry, plays, mm -hmm. art, and I was immersed in that world. And that, it was that passion that, um, that's what I'm doing when I'm making a rehearsal room environment. Mm -hmm. I'm just creating um, that same, I'm being a fan of all of these things at the same time and bringing them together to create an artistic mm -hmm. vision. Does that make sense? Yeah. So moving on from that, I wanted to ask about because um, especially in like drama training and all that, we talk about safe space a lot, mm -hmm. and what might be a safe space for me might be a different for someone else as well. It's such a sensitive idea, but as a director, how do you create that safe space in the rehearsal room where? there's enough room for creativity, but also safety to be vulnerable and all that stuff. It's, to me, it's so complex because my course involves writing and facilitating as well as acting. So this is so interesting for me, but that, mm. that on its own is just a big concept where I, I don't fully seem to understand yet. So what, what is it that makes it a safe space, but also enough creativity like enough risk taking as well, like, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. You're right, so as a director, you are a facilitator, yeah. absolutely. And um, that's something that I really enjoy doing as well, which is um, any, you know, that's the key thing about theatre, that theatre is a sacred space. Mm -hmm. So whether it's a stage, whether it's a rehearsal room, or what, you know, whatever you um, decide to do it, or if it's a conversation between two people, it is, a, I think of it literally as a sacred space um, that you're setting up um, where we can be vulnerable, where we can take risks and where we can meet each other in a truthful way mm. and where we can interrogate questions. That, mm. That's absolutely how I want to interface with the world and that's why I'm a director. Mm. Um, and in terms of um, safety, um, I'm just thinking, when I did my very, very first um, main house show as a young director, the actors all walked out of the room in the first tea break. And uh, obviously, you know, obviously part of that is to do with power, because mm -hmm. they would never do that to a more experienced director, right? Yeah. I was thinking about it. But it's also the fact that um, as the director, quite often, especially when you're starting out, you're the youngest person in the room or mm -hmm. the least experienced person in the room. Because the actors, you know, actors have done loads of jobs. So it's really paying attention to what do they need um, 
on that very first day. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I gave them too much information, maybe I overloaded them with information and what mm -hmm. my vision was and what I was excited about. Um, but it was more about creating, you know, creating a space where they didn't feel nervous, where I could kind of um, more gently mm -hmm. get everyone to know each other. Mm -hmm. So it's really, it's about really um, sort of paying attention to what's happening in front of you mm -hmm. and responding to that, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, I guess it's trial and error in an yeah. aspect, isn't it? I, yeah. I could um, feed in something, because in the last two shows that I've just done, I mean, the conversation around safe spaces at the moment is brilliant, because I feel like it's part of this whole thing that we're talking about, building back better, and, you know, it's depending on who you're in a room with, um, people want to find better ways to work, mm -hmm. and I know that in the last two rehearsal processes I've been in the director's and the company um, have started on day one with creating a manifesto for the room, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. which I would really recommend to people to do because what it does is you set, you set a precedent and everybody feeds in what they need in order to do their best work. Because mm -hmm. that's all it is really. It's, how can, it's asking the question of everybody, what do you need to do your best work? And so me as a writer, it would be things like, um, I need to feel like I don't have to answer your question straight away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, don't, I have to feel safe enough to make mistakes. Um, it's, it's things like, um, if I'm having a bad day, I need to be able to step out. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm feeling overwhelmed, I need to be able to leave the room and it feel like it's not a bad thing. You know, it's just lots of these different things. And once mm -hmm. we kind of had all agreed on them, um, it meant that we kept that in the space through the whole rehearsal room of rehearsal time and every morning and every afternoon you do a check-in and check a check-out yeah. and it just meant that even you know rehearsal periods are always you're always going to have tough bits you're always going to have falling outs you're always going it's just the nature of creativity and the nature of working hard and working on something you care and love you know care about you, you're going to have these crunch points but if you've laid out at the start how you're going to cope with those crunch points and how you're going to support each other and look after each other, um, mm -hmm. it works so much better than just going, we're just going to work and we're just going to get through it and just deal with it out of the room or, you know, don't bring it into the room. Yeah. We're, we're all human beings. We're going to bring things into the room. So we need a chance to say that, like come in in the, in the morning and you're checking and go, I didn't sleep well last night, so yeah. be gentle with me. You know, whatever mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. We got, we, I think we're shifting into a new w era, I hope, where we recognise that we're not supposed to kill ourselves for these jobs, mm -hmm. yeah. um, that we are, we love what we do, but we have limits, we're human yeah. beings. Yeah. Um, and actually, if everybody feels safe and happy, um, we make better work, and you yeah. can see it on the stage. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, leading on from that, and talking about vulnerability and creativity, when you're actually writing pieces, um, where do you get your creativity from? And I know that a lot of your plays, Abby and Morgan, are quite intimate mm -hmm. or, and also discuss topics that obviously are relevant to you. Um, how do you protect yourself in your actual mm -hmm. words as well? Abby, you want to? Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> so I think it's that, it's going into that idea of, you know, some people are really into the idea of write what you know and we all have a story inside us, which is all completely true. But also it's like, write what you know, but then go a bit further. Mm. Because if I've experienced something, then at least one other person has. Mm. And that feels like a story that's ready to be told and shared and then provoke conversations. Mm. I've written a couple of pieces. That, that, so I, because of my heritage, I'm, 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 uh, uh, I'm mixed race, I'm Armenian British. I write a lot of my work is rooted in my Armenian heritage, mm. which nobody's ever heard of. Oh, I don't know if there's <laughs> anyone who's ever heard of Armenia or anything in this audience, but part I of... <laughs> yes, I know, you of course. Because I'm kind of... <laughs> That's <laughs> really That's the pure reason. And it's a special <laughs> moment when you find that. <laughs> but that's, that's the point, is like, part of your work is sharing who you are and what you are, but also you've sort of become an inadvertent activist. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. it's like, well, I need to not only tell my stories, but I have to do a little bit of groundwork before mm -hmm. to explain where, A, where Armenia is, what's happening there, yeah. why you should care. Mm -hmm. And then there's the other part of me, which is, you know, I write, um, a, a, you know, a, I wrote a play called Fabric, which was about sexual assault and consent. 
Uh, and that was a really difficult piece to write, but I always say that there's nothing in it that hasn't happened to a friend of mine, a family member, uh, myself, uh, colleagues, uh, and that's peppered throughout the piece. And it's important to look after those people that you've spoken to to do your research, to make the piece, but also to look after yourself. And I think we carried that through. It was a, it was a great process in the rehearsal room, working with the director and the actor, is that we all, to, uh, talking about the safe space thing as well, feeding into that of going, being really aware that you didn't, it, nothing is worth damaging people for art. Mm -hmm. So I made a conscious decision when I wrote it that there would be no uh, physical depictions of assault. And it was all told through words. And that we work with the actor, the director and I work with the actor to make that safe and secure. And I think that also feeds into the story that we were telling in the play. Uh, and I've kind of carried that through into any other work that I make as a conscious decision to not have gendered violence depicted on stage. Mm. Um, mm, oh, I'm good. slightly lost mm. my track there, but anyway, <laughs> I do that a lot. Yeah, we love um, <laughs> but yeah, there's, there's two strands yeah. that, that, that you, you know, you write what you know, and then the minute you start telling those stories, you, you start sharing them, um, and you realise that other people have those same stories yeah. as well. I think um, moving on from that exact point, I'm Kurdish from Turkey. Mm -hmm. Not going to go into the politics of it right now, Let's but not. <laughs> we'll do that in the play. Yes. <laughs> but um, I'm also um, really, really trying to write something at the moment mm. to do with this. Like mm -hmm. you said, we all have a story mm -hmm. inside, mm. but it's just so flipping difficult. Like it's just so, <laughs> so hard. How do you sit down? and write something that's so precious to you, so personal mm. to you, mm. but you know now that you've got this voice, the world has to hear it. Mm -hmm. But it's just so hard to sometimes sit with those emotions or yeah. just find the motivation or even once you've written it, let go of some parts that don't yeah. work. It's your baby now and mm. especially the relationship of yeah. writer, director, you know, you have to let go of some things, you have to hand mm -hmm. it to someone else to take care mm -hmm. of it. It's so, so precious. Um, and hard mm. like what are some of the tips you all can give to make that happen when it's so so precious um sh should i go first yeah all, all, no go for it all of you <laughs> yeah, all of you um <laughs> big question i would say if, when you start writing be really specific choose that thing yeah. and then just absolutely give everything to it so you you know i know that your story is going to be incredible because we will have shared and this is the point we'll have shared intersex in that story mm -hmm. the minute you said i'm kurdish and my family's from turkey then there's a whole play there already yeah. between us in this space here so it's like <laughs> find that moment absolutely mm -hmm. go for it because you know it you're living it yeah. you understand it mm -hmm. um and i think take the time again it's it always comes back to this safe space idea is take the time to when you've written your first draft you don't have to send it out straight away. You can yeah. sit with it for a bit, put it in a drawer, come back to it two weeks later, reread it. Just give yourself a break from it when it's so intensely personal. Mm -hmm. But that's the thing that makes it really great, will yeah. make it stronger. And also, like I said, you, you have that story, someone else will in the world that will read it or see it and go, I, yeah. I exist, I feel seen. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'll go and write it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm try. <laughs> but oh, I mean, I'm going to say exactly yeah. the same thing, and it is just uh, it, who are you, who are you writing it for? Yeah. If you're yeah. getting yourself stuck in the mire of it and thinking this is only a, an individual, this is only my mm. story. Why would anybody want to hear it? Ask yourself who else might need to hear it. Mm -hmm. Because um, yeah, when you put it out into the world, you do realise how how these these stories haven't been told, and we need to hear them. Mm. We've been hearing all the same stories for yeah. quite a long time now, so these yeah. stories that we've, we've been told that we sh we, nobody wants to hear them, they do, they mm. really do. I was also going to add, um, Morgan, in your writing, there's a lot of comedy <laughs> within the meaningful things as well. Like, there's a big contrast. And obviously, like, people say theatre is made of light and dark, that kind, of, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. But how do you... I don't know if it's just natural and it just comes to you, but how do you balance that? in a way that's <laughs> so nuanced yeah uh, um, is it lots of drafts is it other people telling you is it you saying the jokes out loud or? <laughs> <laughs> there's a bit of that to be honest. Yeah. um because i came from comedy so mm. i kind of i uh, i i tried to write things 
<laughs> I think the problem is, is that <laughs> life is light and dark. I think that's mm. the thing. You try and write something really deadly serious and you can't help but get to a point with it where you go, well, yeah, but at this point I'd probably make a bit of a joke because it's so dark. Mm. Okay. You know, we, the, the funniest moments I've been in my, mm. in my real life have been the really dark, sad yeah. moments. Mm. You know, the so somebody's dead. And, and it's, not you know, and, and you're, you, you find you're suddenly joking about the mm. fact that you know, my dead grandma's sitting on, lying on her ripple bed and I think she's come back to life again. It's like, you know, it's one of those things where you go, this is so absurd, but it's hysterical, but it's also really sad. And mm. I think, I think that that's why when I, I write, if I'm doing something that is really sad or really dark, um, I think the human thing is to find something light in it. Um, mm -hmm. And also, just in a purely mm. technical way, I'm always thinking about the journey of the audience. And mm. actually, if I've just done something really sad to them, <laughs> then I'm going to want to cheer them up. Yeah. And, you know, the roller coaster of a show yeah. for me is about taking the audience on a journey. And that's the other question I'm always asking when I'm writing is, well, how, is the, how is the audience going to be feeling in this moment? And what, where do I want to take them next? And, and, and often, I don't, I don't want to just send, you know, depending on the design of the show, I, I kind of want to make sure it feels like something where they're getting a whole journey in there. So comedy's part of that as well as mm. tragedy. Yeah. <laughs> and Puna, yeah. the, you um, do a lot of work with uplifting female voices, yeah. etc. Mm -hmm. How do you manage the responsibility of doing that as a director? Um, <laughs> sorry. Do you? I mean, the thing is, I can't not do that work. Mm. That's part. That's part of it, isn't it? Um, I am. Um, I am British Asian and I am female, and so it's kind of it is a burden. You're right, and it's sort of it's handed to you because you're asked to represent, and you're asked mm. to represent represent um, in a way that's kind of impossible because you can't represent everybody. So um, it's about um, digging into the specificity of the stories, just just what Abby was saying. Um, mm. It's the specificity, because actually everyone's got a unique story. Mm. Whoever they are, that's what you realise. Mm. And um, everyone's got their own family, everyone's got their own um, experiences. And so rather than, I'm just talking about like, you know, when there's a blanket approach to diverse stories or BAME B -A -M -E stories, and mm. there's, one, there's one supermodel who's like in charge of... Of, of representing all of that that's impossible yeah. mm. and definitely um as a younger director you're handed that all of the time by institutions and by buildings mm. um, um and it kind of does mess with your sense of your own identity as well yeah. so the reason i became an artist is because i want to reinvent myself endlessly mm. it's not because i want to be the you know my labels and my boxes so i found that a real mm. struggle i think but um, you're right at the same time that um, I do want to tell the female stories. Mm. And um, I was just thinking about in terms of um, how we work with writers, what's useful. And I think the, I do do a lot of dramaturgy with writers and the objective eye that a director has can be really, really useful. But I do spend a lot of time getting to know the writer inside out and getting to, know, getting to try to understand what was the trigger for mm. the, the play. Mm. So, you know, there's pros and cons. If you've got a writer who's with you alive, then you, you know, you, you, it might feel a bit nosy, but you've got to really find out, you know, every, as much as you can. Mm, and if yeah. they're not alive, then that's great because then you can just go to town <laughs> and just do lots of research. You can go and visit, go, go and check out where they lived and find out everything. I'm doing a play at the moment about Nora Nyack Khan, who was a spy for the British mm. um, in World War II. So that's a kind of a biographical story. So we've done so much research. Mm. and been able to really dig into lots of different, different um, accounts and ways of telling her story to find the, find the story that we want to tell, which is about her inner life. Mm. Um, so, um, yeah, and, but the other thing that I was interested to say is that writing for theatre, um, the writing is a blueprint for performance. Mm. Mm. So, so is the, how is that different to writing something in a literary way? Do you think about it or you don't even mm. need to think about it? No, I think you do. I think, yeah, like, yeah absolutely you do. Mm, I, yeah. I think, like I said, I'm always thinking about the audience. The audience is always the sort of the, mm. the other, yeah. when I'm thinking about story and I'm also thinking about 
the actor, I mean, that's the other thing I think because I have acted, yeah. I'm thinking about the experience that the actors are going to have performing my play. Like that's I'm kind great. of trying to make sure everybody has enough lines, mm. but also that it's going to be fun and mm. interesting and meaty and they're all going to have, it helps, you know, when you're developing the character, you suddenly realise, oh, I've neglected that. If you're thinking about it from the point of view, an actor's going to come and, and work on this character, mm. they're going to ask me all these questions about them and actually, oh, I'm not sure about that one because mm. I've sort of shoved her in, but I yeah. need to really work mm. on her. So I've got the answers for the actor because they're going to come and mm. bring amazing things to it. But yeah, it's absolutely a performance. So mm. we're, right, we're not writing plays to be read. We're writing plays to be performed. And mm. you, you always have that in your head when... And, and particularly, I think, when you're developing new writing and once, when you get to the point where you've got a director on board and then a designer, so you're really starting to work towards the physical sense of it. And yeah. that's the bit I love. Like, yeah. actually, sitting in a room on your own writing is pretty lonely. And I kind of love theatre because mm. you do yeah. get to be in a space with people and dreaming yeah. big and making mm. things in the room yeah. and all that kind of thing. That's, that's what I love about I guess, writing. I guess the, the audience is always at the focus because they're yeah. the ones experiencing it. Yeah. Speaking about the audience, I think it's time <laughs> it's we open it up to the audience as well. As much as I'm enjoying asking loads of questions, I don't want to be selfish. <laughs> so anyone, any questions? We've got one up there, please. Yeah. Before you respond to that, so yeah. sorry, um, because Wait. of the concept of being half live, mm -hmm. we have to have every question repeated to the microphone so that the audience mm -hmm. on online can hear yeah. them as well and then answer them after the microphone, please. Understood. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. So I'm just going to repeat back our question. Did anyone, especially Morgan, right, um, <laughs> find the experience daunting to be switching from being a director to a writer? From actor to Sorry, a writer. Sorry, from actor, actor to a writer. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it wasn't, to be honest, it wasn't, I, I was writing my own stuff as an actor anyway. So we were writing our own um, shows. Um, and I was finding the acting more daunting, to be honest. <laughs> um, but I, I, when I started writing, I think I, I was in my mid 20s. And um, I, I found the world of theatre quite daunting. I didn't really know how to sort of make my mark in it. I definitely wasn't writing the sort of plays that were being commissioned at the Royal Court, for example. Mm. I wasn't writing plays mm. that were that people w wanted in that sense. And I kind of had to go in a very different route. I, I did a lot of um, big community shows and and Christmas shows and, and team written. I did quite a lot of team written stuff, actually. Um, and I, that probably helped me kind of ease mm. my way in because I wasn't ju it wasn't just me on my own. But I also did a lot of shorts nights and got together with a group of other writers and we would just kind of once a month at Theatre 503, we just, on one of their dark nights, we just asked them if we could have it and we would just write short plays. We'd all write a short play each once a month and we'd gather together a load of actors and directors and put them on and, and practised, our, like worked out what our voice was really. So. I guess in terms of sort of making that transition, I'd really highly recommend doing something like that where you, because you don't really know how you want to write or what you want to write about. Mm. And you don't know what your voice is and you don't know what you're really interested in focusing on in terms of topic and, and theme. So doing short pieces is a really nice way of trying stuff out and also creating a community of directors and actors around you that and producers, like you start creating a world of, other people around you to support you and and bring you up with them and you bring them up and you know it's in terms of transitioning I would really suggest doing that kind of thing um, because that really helped me work out who I wanted to be as a writer Thank you. yeah there's a question up there if you shout <laughs> it yeah. I can repeat it no <laughs> oh. oh great <laughs> oh wow that was great they got the mic up Mm -hmm. 
so just to hop back to our question, <coughs> um, to both the directors <coughs> and the writers, how, what's your preferred way to be able to collaborate with a voice coach? Um, uh, good question. I, um, I think it depends on how, also how you like to work. Hmm. Because, it's, because it's a collaboration, isn't it? So I, what I find is the best way to get, um, the best way to work with collaborators is to figure out how we work best together. So, and um, so with voice coaches, um, what I do is, um, you, um, I'd have you in rehearsal as much as possible. That's the first thing, isn't it? Because that's what's really hard on the finances is to have everybody in the room as much as possible watching the rehearsal. Um, and then try to give you time, separate time as well, to work. Um, so when I was at the Royal Shakespeare Company, um, we used voice coaches a lot, and they had separate sessions with cast members. Because it was, it was accent, it was like working on voice as well as working on accent. Mm. It all goes together. And then also, then, then the voice coach can um, be part of the daily warm-ups and things like that as well, because you're trying to build, the thing about theatre is that you're trying to build towards a performance and you're trying to build the stamina um, and the good habits of doing a performance that has to be sustained over a long period of time. So that daily practice in the morning is really good as well, a little mm -hmm. exercises and things that you set with the actor. But you need, you need to have your own time allotted. You can't, it's impossible, it's very difficult to slot that into all the other work that's happening. There's so mm -hmm. many things going on. Um, when we're when I'm staging a scene, for example. Mm. So um, yeah, so I would get I would watch rehearsal. I would um, get um, separate sessions um, with the actor, and then find ways of um, suggesting exercises and things to, um, for the morning practice. Mm. And and note session like so when you do when you um, when we do um, tech or preview or whatever note sessions, mm. half an hour. Otherwise, you can't really do your work. <laughs> Definitely, and um, I know it's hard. It's hard, um, maybe financially, to get you in at the beginning, but it's so beneficial to do that closer to the beginning maybe so it's planning with the director and seeing if you can if that can happen mm -hmm. because for the actor can you imagine if they've you've set up a beautiful performance and then you're trying to layer that on top that would just mm -hmm. throw everything out of balance again mm. yeah mm. yeah Amazing. yeah i think we've got a question from online <laughs> yes so someone's asked as writers and directors <coughs> what pathways are available in terms of training and work to get a foot in the door perhaps roots outside of academic institutions? Hmm. <laughs> Sorry, did, that, did I do that out loud? <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, it's a weird one, because I, I, I'm going to talk uh, just in terms of personally as, as how I got into writing. As you know, I came through a different route in that I was doing a different job, uh, so I came to it slightly later. Uh, now, we, you know, a lot of people know if you... You know, you might be aware that there's lots of writers' groups with theatres at Royal Court, Young Writers' Group, uh, Soho Theatre, lot, lots of them do it. There's also, you can do MAs in, uh, if you're going through the university route in creative writing. Uh, and there's a lot of us who have not done any of that, and it feels like a very inorganic route. Or maybe it's an organic route to get to writing. I think um, I would say if you want to write, then just start writing. Mm. That's what I did, and it took me slightly longer because you don't really know what you're doing, so you learn as you go along. I didn't know about what, I didn't know what a three-act structure was, which sounds, you know, I can't believe I'm saying this out loud. And it's recorded. <laughs> but I didn't, and there's a lot of people who don't. There's a lot of kids who want to write and don't know that there's, actually, that, yeah, there is a right way to do it, but also, why not just write? Um, I think one of the best things I ever did was about four or five years into writing, having written a couple of plays, and it taken me forever, was to... Uh, I signed up and did a course with um, 
Stephen Jeffries, who passed away a few years ago, an amazing playwright. He ran a course at RADA um, mm. called Introduction to Script Writing. And it was, I wish I'd done that like four years ago because it literally gave me the toolbox to know how to write a play. And I mean that from in, in terms of the, just the tools of, of how to do research, of to not worry about, you don't, you know, you don't have to sit down and write the play. I'm sure lots of us have done this, where it's like, oh, I've got a brilliant idea, I'll start writing. And then you just run out of steam because mm. you don't know what the middle is, you don't know what the end is. Mm. Um, and that was one of the best things I did was, so I, I, I would recommend, you know, if you can get yourself on a course where it's literally, you know, the A to Z of, of, of the basics of how to structure a script. Because until you know that, you don't know how to rip it all apart mm. and do it a different way. And that's completely all right as well. I think there's no rules in writing. I'm a big proponent of that kind of, you, you don't have to have done a course. You don't have to have been on a writer's group. You don't, you know, you literally, mm. you, you want to write a play, write a play. And if it doesn't follow a three act structure or it doesn't, it doesn't behave in the way it's supposed to, that's absolutely fine as well. Mm. So I think what I'm saying is just do it anyway. There isn't really a <laughs> route because, you know, it's not... It, 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 yeah, I just think you, you just got to get the words down, you've got to get the words out, um, mm. and it all, it, yeah, you, you know, oh God, I'm really losing my thread here. I think got, I would, I, just to yeah. add to that, I think it's, it's, Theatre, theatre is an elitist thing. Yes. It yeah. still is. You know, it's hard to get into it unless yeah. you've got um, connections in there, unless you've got money. Because a lot of the time, uh, the way into theatre is to do a lot of work for not for no money. Yeah. Um, mm. And so, if, the one thing I would say is have have a job. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, work, work, yeah. Have have a job that's going to keep things ticking over underneath it. Everybody yeah. that I know who's gone into theatre mm. has. You know, I, I had several waitressing jobs. I was working as a temp and work, writing at night time. You, you just kind of have to do that. And, and I always say that because I, I feel like we need to normalise that. It's no, mm. it's, it's no bad thing. Mm. Um, that's Unfortunately, that's how you do it, unless you've got backup money. I mean, this is why in the olden days you yeah. had benefactors, right? Because they kind of gave you, gave you money yeah. to go and do your art. But we don't have that. <laughs> so, like, just accept that you'll probably need a job and that's, yeah. that's fine. And find one that's flexible. Find one that you mm. can do whatever that is, mm. whether it's personal tutoring or, you know, waitressing or whatever, there's, there's, there's options out there in that sense. And then just to second what Abby said, start making theatre. And, mm. mm. and whenever I talk to people about it, theatre is literally, it can be one person in front of another person in a mm. room or outside. It can be the smallest thing in the world. It can be the biggest thing in the world. Whatever it is, start exploring story, start thinking about the stories that you want to tell and thinking about how you might want to do that in a physical sense with other people and gather together your, the people that you like working with and just start doing it. Mm. And you can apply for funding, you can write to people, you can do a crowdfunding, <laughs> you yeah. know, it's actually, it's, it, you can do theatre on a, on a shoestring and the more you do it, the more you'll work out what theatre you want to make and what stories you want to tell. Mm. And hopefully people start giving you money to do that mm. and people start paying notice and, you know, it's, I'm not, I, basically, it's not easy um, at mm. all. And some people find it easier than others. Um, but if you can surround yourself with people who you enjoy working with and who are going to support you and cheer for you mm. and come to your first nights and, um, and uh, you know, and tell you that you're great, even when the reviews are telling you you're <laughs> shit. Um, all of those things are really important. Um, so, yeah, it, it, I, I guess I'm saying it, I can... It's, it's off-putting because there are a lot of barriers there, but there are ways around that, and, um, yeah. I thought but, but also things. not asking for permission. Yeah. That's mm. it. yeah. Because I think that was one of the problems is kind of like, um, if you ask for advice, you'll be told to wait. Yeah. Mm. Wait until you're ready, and it, you'll never yeah. be ready. It's one yeah. of those things. That, and I've, I had that a lot, you know, wait, wait, no, 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 you yeah. need this, you need... Mm. You need don't. experience. Yeah, yeah, you need... And it's, it's one of those chicken and egg things always with directing as well, and, and directing is a practical art. Mm. Mm. So you had, that's why I said the books are a toolbox. Yeah, They're there for those moments when you need help. Yeah. But, um, but actually doing it and finding... Um, connecting with your gut instinct, mm. even now, that's... that's um, the main directing, most useful directing tool. Mm. Um, so, so yeah, so partly it's about permission and power and mm. taking that power for yourself. Mm. I had to do that myself as well and set up my own company at one point when I wasn't getting what 
when um, the work from the establishment, if you like, wasn't feeding mm. me, I, mm. you know, I thought. But also, um, it's about finding your role. Mm. Because when you have, if you work in a group or you work in a collective, you can find out actually what, your, what role you would most like to do. Mm. And it might be that you like to do a number of different things. <laughs> and I think we're seeing a lot of theatre like that now, aren't we? Yeah. Where there's a lot more cross fertilization there's a lot more interdisciplinary work mm. happening. Mm. Yep. And I'm excited about that work because I think it challenges form. Yeah. And, yeah. and um, that's, that, that challenging a form is an opportunity for new stories to be told. Mm. So, so not only just a linear... Mm. maybe male driven narrative maybe you know different forms mm. so that all comes from this um this kind of way of working mm. yeah so I we're very we're very encouraging about doing that i, I think just, just follow sorry. on with that as well in yeah. terms of the last two years we've had like all of my work like i know a lot of people all my work went last year it was all cancelled because you couldn't do it live yeah. but i did more work digitally and online like my agent was like, Abby, don't complain. Like you've had a really good year. I've written more contracts for you than the, the yeah. last sort of five years. And it's like uh, it's the models that we uh, that we think of as theatre. Mm. I've done a complete 360 from the start of the pandemic to it's mm. not theatre if it's online and film. It's just film to go in. It's about the moment of liveness and how you connect, and that mm, feeds into yeah. what we were talking about earlier about thinking about why theatre is different. Mm. Writing a play is different to writing a book. Mm. Yeah. And it's how you always constantly think of how your audience is engaging with it. And we're all mm -hmm. looking at different forms now. And I'm really excited about making theatre yeah. that's across form. So it's digital, it's multimedia, it's, it, you know, it's audio, it's binaural, it's all sorts of things. Mm. So the way you write and what you write now isn't just, I don't just think, oh, it's on a stage. Mm. to people. And, and alongside that, you're thinking about accessibility. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I write now not just assuming that everyone can see and hear and be yeah. in a physical space. Mm, and that's yeah. only happened because of the last two years. And yeah. I think that's a really exciting place to, to be. Yeah. I think those are all really, really valuable points. Um, if, if I was to summarise, theatre is changing mm. and we have a lot more creative, free, creative freedom and chance to be experimental than ever, I guess. Mm. Um, to move on, I think we've got time for one more question. Oh, there's many people. I saw your hand first, so I'm gonna go there. Oh, no, this <laughs> She keeps putting Hi. So the question was, who was some of your inspirations outside of the theatre and in the theatre. I was inspired by Morgan. <laughs> oh, oh, stop it. Amelia. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Don't stop now. That's very kind of you. Um, go on. Can I say anything I like? Yeah. Um, uh, do you know who Patti Smith is? Mm. Yeah. And if you don't look her up, she's yeah. from... She's been around for a long time. She's a poet. I'd say she's a rock poet. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and I saw her play at the Royal Albert Hall a couple of weeks ago. And, that, uh, and um, at, the end, so at the end of the gig, she ripped all the strings off her guitar. And she must be about 75. Um, and basically, I had one of those amazing communal, shared, live moments where there were 5,000 people all with our, with our attention, all funneling towards her guitar hmm. and just waiting to see what happened next. And so I felt the power of that shared live mm. experience together. And that was, you know, for her, the message was to be uplifting and to be transformative. Mm. Her message is always power to the people. Mm. And, um, you know, despite all the cynicism of everything that's going on in our world now, I felt it in that moment and it was super exciting. And, oh. but, you know, for me, that liveness, um, that's what's special about theatre is it's this moment with these mm. people here now and it will be different like tomorrow night will be different and it'll, it will always be different so within one performance it's always evolving and changing mm. and that's what you only get you know because I work in film too but that's what you only can get in the theatre that's mm. so special mm. um, so yeah Patti Smith look her up <laughs> it's great Amazing. I, I mean it's music as well like mm. it's always music to be honest every time <laughs> I Every, every time I do a new project, I tend to create a soundtrack for it that is the vibe of it, even if it's not got music in it. Mm. Because then when I'm going back into something, I play the music and it kind of gets my head back in. Um, so my last, mm. I just did a show called Typical Girls, which is using the music of the slits. And um, 
And the, I mean, I would say they're, they're still in my head. Is, I think it, like, it shifts for me. It depends on what project's going. But So I'm going to choose the slits um, because of their liveness, mm. because of their, they were so true to what they were, the music that they wanted to make to the point where they refused to play ball with the record company and made absolutely no money. And, but they, <laughs> they have influenced pop music in a way that we probably don't really grasp now, but they really yeah. did. You, you sort of trace it all back and they're just amazing. The spirit of punk is in them and they, they were pioneers. So um, I feel like in theatre we can be pioneers and we can make changes and we can rip things up and try new things and ignore what we're being told to do and do the thing that's in our, mm. in our hearts. Um, so yeah, I choose this. Yeah, it's it's my amazing. Inspiration. <laughs> yeah, sorry, that was me. <laughs> uh, let's hear from you, Abby, as well, before we cut off. Uh, I wasn't joking when I said Morgan was an inspiration. <laughs> I, so Morgan's, Morgan's a really good friend of mine, and she, she's a constant support. And what you, one other th a bit of advice, I was like, if you're going to go into writing or this industry, is build your own tribe. Get yeah. your people mm. around you that you love, and you love their work, but you love working with them. Um, because they will pick you up when you are right at the bottom going, I can't do this anymore. Mm. And that's, yeah. that's what Morgan does, as well as inspiring me to <laughs> make know. my own work. <laughs> um, in terms of theatre influences, Pina Bausch. Mm. Pina Bausch just... I, and I didn't, again, never heard of her until I started writing and then just totally changed the way I think about how you make work. Um, and also just lots of, lots of film and music share... Big yeah, influence. Cher is in yeah. every single piece I write. Um, <laughs> Cher, just Cher. Um, That's amazing. Yeah. I love Cher too. Yeah. Oh, she's Armenian. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to have to uh, yeah. end it there because we're running out of time. But that was so, so, so valuable. Oh. I've personally learned so much. I've said this in the last panel as well, but I'm serious. Um, I'm sure most people have too. But thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you.